special thanks to the PG PPM students and the EPGP spouses that have come in the crowd today. This is the first time that we have uh, we are organizing seminar in the auditorium, and this is the first time that we have invited an outside crowd. The reasons are fairly simple. We just did not want anyone to lose the opportunity to hear from ma'am. Uh, I would give a short brief introduction of ma'am here. Dr. Manyan's contribution to the development of Indian culture is unique. She has been spreading intellectual business understanding among foreign direct investors via her initiative called Global Adjustments. Founder and chairperson of Global Adjustments, she's empowering young Indians to maximize their potential. She mentors and educates on a variety of life skills. She's also the editor of India's only cultural magazine for expats called Culturama. Armed with a dealit in cross-cultural business excellence and having served on the Harvard Business Leadership Board, Dr. Banyan is committed to her efforts for enhancing the success of global Indians. We are very glad to have you here, ma'am. The stage you. is all yours. Please take over. <laughs> may, I, may I please request Prabha ma'am to present the bouquet to Dr. Banyan. So, I'm basing all my comments and my stories on 22 years of helping the world come and set up in India. All those dots that you see on the world map are the 78 nationalities that we have had the privilege of working with, whether it is IKEA, who comes from Sweden, or Hyundai, who comes from Korea, or, of course, America, Amazon, and all these companies. We've had nationalities from around the world that we've worked with. So the stories of cultural intelligence adapting to them, them adapting to our country, is from that 22-year legacy. Also, we've looked at just this past year that we've trained or helped empower global citizens with workshops, Indians to understand the world. So those are the foreigners coming to work with India, right? And the other 2,435 global citizens are the Indians in corporate India that we've gone into, and we've helped them to get on with worldwide business etiquette, being a uh, global citizen, and so on. So we've had opportunities to do work in real time, in real businesses. So what happened 22 years ago? I was, I told you, arranged to fall in love marriage and I was set up in Chennai. I was from Bombay, and I, didn't, I thought Madras at the time was really boring, and I kept thinking it was boring till I discovered the opportunity to start an entrepreneurship, a niche entrepreneurship called Relocation Services, which helps foreign businesses to set up in India. And it was Joanne Grady Husky, the American that you see in that image, who came there as a diplomatic spouse and gave me that idea. Because in America, it's very common Okay, got it. Um, it's very common to have a relocation service to move you from one state to the next, even internally. What do we do? We have to help with their visas, their FRRO documents, setting up their, all their utilities, finding the house, finding the schools for the children. Oh my God, my dog has to go to the right veterinarian. Who's the right vet? Um, how do I handle maids in India? Because I'm used to having coffee and breakfast with my if ever I could afford a maid, then she would sit and eat coffee and breakfast with me. What do I do in India? So many questions, which seem like from the mundane to the very serious. I have a senior vice president in my company. He's hiring more and more people from his own community. Is this a diversity issue? What's going on? So some will be at that level, and some will be at everyday level. And that was the business that we started. And that business gave me a lot of opportunities to go out into the world and welcome businesses to come to India. For example, this was a road show that I did for KPMG with automotive companies telling them, please invest in India. It's m far more sustainable than China. That's my mantra. I go around saying that. And so which company is this? KPMG. You watched a previous feature of mine. You're not allowed to answer any questions. Um, yes, KPMG took me on the tour. And yes, it was Aston Martin. This is uh, Ulrich Betts, the CEO of Aston Martin, who uh, 
was part of the audience that, and you know, so we have an opportunity to tell people, highlighting the positives of doing business in India, never lying about the challenges of doing business in India, because that's not what we are about, but maybe helping circumvent the issues and challenges of how to do business in India. And from those 22 years, what I've learned over time is two things. One, cultural intelligence, which I've put into some books here. One is called Upworldly Mobile. And I'll be happy to leave it for you in your library. And the other, which, which Narayan Murthy was launching in Bangalore, and the foreword of which Sashi Tharoor wrote. And the other book, um, which I'll show you, is We Make It in India, which I'll leave also in your library. Happy to do that. So I've learned a little bit of cultural adaptation and intelligence, and very close to my heart. And because I was on that board, it was not the business board at Harvard, Karishma. It was the Women's Leadership Board. In the uh, Kennedy School of Government in Harvard, there's a Women's Leadership Board. And I was lucky enough to be invited to be the only Indian woman at that time to join the board and work with the dean for the advancement of women and girls at Harvard and beyond. So learned a lot of things on gender, diversity, and inclusion. And then I realized, what am I doing flying 10,000 miles going to Boston to do this? There are many people closer to home. And we can take that model and make it more Indian and apply that wisdom to India. And so I took a sabbatical from that. And now I spend my life with a foundation. I have a daughter who runs my for-profit business. Global Adjustments is run by Rohini. And I'm a, with a band of 63 lovely teams of admirals. And I'm able to spend time on the foundation helping do good by empowering young Indians with holistic life excellence. What does that mean? It means having cultural intelligence. It means having gender intelligence. It means having emotional intelligence and wisdom and centeredness too. So at this moment in my life, to come back to an IIM like company, like group, it's awesome. So those are the three books. But the first book, everybody laughs about doing business in India for dummies. But as you know, the dummy series, it's actually just a very simple format of books that's written. And that's what made, uh, I think, made me get into the board at Harvard, because people noticed things like that at the time. So why do young Indians matter? That's the question I asked myself driving this morning. And then I thought, I have a client today in Bangalore. His name is Paul Dupuy. If you open the Times of India today, he's been interviewed. And he is the CEO of Randstad. As you know, Randstad is the world's second largest HR company that finds people really good jobs. So in case anybody here is interested, I think Randstad might be a great place to also call into your campus for interviews. But why I'm talking about Paul is he has said in the interview that tech and touch are always going to go together. Please don't think that just because we become technically so advanced that the human touch is going to ever disappear. Even more than before, the human touch is going to be relevant. It's going to be important that we know how to build relationships with each other across boundaries and borders, as well as with all genders and all diversity. I want you to listen to uh, Seisha Sai, who launched the second book, and uh, listen to the chairman of Infosys and how he believes in young Indians and how many opportunities he loves to give them. When I became a CEO, uh, one of the things that I did was to encourage uh, a lot of these people who were in the operational level to come and sit in strategic meetings. And uh, because of deference for the seniority and the hierarchy and all of that, uh, there will be nobody in the, from the people who are lined up against the wall uh, taking part. One day I found that one of these uh, uh, boys who was sitting there was shaking his head like that uh, because he didn't quite agree with what was being mentioned by his boss. Uh, and it was not even a big shake, I mean, very gently. Uh, so I drove him out and said, uh, you, you don't think you agree with this? And he wouldn't say, but I had to encourage him. And then he came out. Then I found that uh, he truly had a very strategic uh, viewpoint on the issue. So it's quite often that they don't have an opportunity to, to engage. Now following that, my second experience was that we put a bunch of youngsters uh, drawn from 
the operational level, middle management and junior management, bunch of young kids, and I asked them to do, you do the plan for next year. Uh, our entire management plan for the next year was done by this bunch of young kids. And uh, believe me, that was, it was a parallel exercise, was a far more strategic uh, outlook of the business than our top team had come up with. So he actually implemented it. And he's talking about young kids who are 28 year olds, which I think is the average age of this room, isn't it? And that's the 500 million people in India, isn't it? The millennials. So that's why it's very special that I can spend some time and share with you and that you are the future of India. So why gender intelligence? There are only 22 women. What do you want me to do with it? Is that your question, Abhishek? Did I just hear you say that? Why do you want to do gender intelligence? <laughs> you didn't say it. I just put the words in your mouth. Why gender intelligence? Because let's see how much of gender intelligence we actually have, OK? If it comes out right, then we don't need to do it. How many, what percent of women say that they understand men? Women say 74% of them understand. OK? It's a little bit wrong. 68% of you say that we understand. And this is Barbara Annis, the woman who was the chair on the Harvard board, who did this research. OK, so, so and what percent of men say they understand women now? 36, right? Who said 36? Who said 36? You wish. 9%. So we need gender intelligence. Because we women think, well, I think we understand men completely. And the men, they're going, I don't know, I don't get this. Why is she mad at me? I gave her a gift. I bought her a sari for 5,000 rupees just three months ago when it was her birthday. Yeah, but if you buy one big thing for 5,000, that doesn't last for 90 days. It's how you give it, how you look in my eyes, how you package it, how you say you're looking very nice in that sari. All of those things that add up, right? So gender intelligence is not trying to get men and women to do everything together all the time. So this is what I wanted to just say. Please don't think that's what we are trying to do here. It is also not assuming that, hey, what is the problem? In the workplace, we're going to be facing the same problems, the same challenges. So what's the problem? It's not that we're trying to do. And neither is it, hey, let's be really nice to the women here. Gender intelligence is not about being nice to women. So what is it then? What do you think it is? It's understanding that each one is unique, right? And what is unique, we can leverage it maybe. What else is gender intelligence, you think? Can you give me one reason why we should be looking at gender intelligence? The intelligence of working with the strengths of both men and women for the time being in this discussion. I can give you another. It's about generally knowing that this is how women's brains will work, and this is how men's brains might work, or this is how the man might expect the meeting to run, or the woman might run the meeting, but not stereotyping. So at the end of this talk, I don't want you to say, but that's not true. I work with this woman. She's not like that. There are exceptions to every rule. So it's a bit of generalizing just for the sake of knowing. Just as we say Germans are particular about time, Indians are a little more relaxed about time. That's generalization, right? And gender intelligence is, can we treat different genders slightly differently so that we get the best desired result? And that's all it is. So with that in mind, I'm going to just give you three quick stories that I have faced in my personal life, organizational life, and nationally, and which helped me because I think I applied gender intelligence, and it helped me to get the outcome that I wanted. So let me tell you the story in level one. So men's brains usually are wired in a way that it has a, uh, you know this, right? A hormone called testosterone, which is fight or flight. Let's get to it. Let's do the tasks. Let's uh, be efficient about it. And let's move on. Whereas women are, have more of which chemical? Estrogen is also there, but progesterone. 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 But you know the chemical which makes us bond? Oxytocin. Yes. Who said that? Price for you. Oxytocin. 
So oxytocin is what makes us want to share and build and include and, and uh, make, make sure that everybody is included. With this knowledge, if you were to apply it in my life, I had to work with the Germans. See, cultures are also called masculine or feminine cultures, by the way. So the German culture is at a 66 on the Geert Hofstetter model. Hofstetter model. You know that Geert Hofstetter was the guru of uh, intercultural work. And he showed that the German scale is masculine at 66, and India comes up 56, is more feminine as a country. What does that mean? We are more into making sure relationships work over tasks, whereas they are more prone to having achievements, tasks as the centerpiece. So when you look at this, and I had to be in a startup entrepreneurship, I was very keen to win one account of a luxury car segment. Can you guess which one, German? BMW. BMW. And the BMW team was coming. And I was this little person, and they were all these six feet, four inches tall Germans. And uh, so I realized that they are going to be more interested in task and efficiency, right, over just building relationships, which is what I'm really good at. So they gave me one hour and 45 minutes, and they said the chairman of the board is coming. His name was Norbert at the time. And they said, in one hour 45 minutes, just quickly show him everything about doing business in India and do a tour of Chennai also. In one hour 45 minutes, 5,000 year old history I have to tell, and I have to show this, and time is crucial for them. So I picked certain things. We went to the Marina Beach, but on the Marina Beach in Chennai, I showed them that there is the Santom Basilica, which is the only three places in the world where a church is built on actually an apostle of Jesus. So Christianity came to India long before it went to Germany, and they were very impressed. Right from there, we went to uh, the Madras Club, which is the heritage home of the East India Company. And you talk about the Raj and the importance of that. And then you, I sat down and explained various aspects of how people didn't just colonialize India. They did colonialize our minds a little bit. And we have a little attitude with saying, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, sometimes. And then at other times, we'll be fighting and saying 100 times, that's not right, that's not right. We, we can seesaw between this and the other. And that's not because we are rude. It's because our mindset is the way it is. So understand us. So stuff like that. And then we finished the tour, and I took him back to the, um, to the Taj. And he actually was um, happy. He didn't want to sit in the BMWs. There were six BMWs lined to bring him. He didn't want to sit there. He sat in the bus with me and said, it's OK, just explain the city. And I said to him, how come? You're so down to earth. You're the chairman of the board of BMW. And he said, I've read Ramana Maharishi, Who Am I? And I've been a yoga practitioner for, since I was 15. Applaud India, seriously. I realized, and he had never been to India before. He was investing in BMW first time in India. I suddenly realized, oh my god, people are the same. And you never know where India's influence has gone. So when we dropped him back at the Taj, I said to him, sir, I was given one hour 45 minutes. Please notice it's one hour 42 minutes now. And you have a good sense of the city and the business. Um, I've been very happy working with you. I hope that uh, you realize that we are professionals too. They hired us after that. <laughs> Till today, BMW is one of our top company clients. So what did I do? I gave him the efficiency and the task thing. I showed him I was on time. I still did the things that I thought were important to him. And so now the new chairman of the board is Haral Kruger. And last year, he came back. And they were thinking of investing in China further or India. And he has been convinced that the Modi government is going to be there for the long term. And so they are going to continue to invest in India. That's on the personal level, just quickly to share with you a story, OK? Let's go to level two. I said I'll give you a story on? Just checking if you're awake. Yeah, organizational. So on the organizational level, so I leveraged this aspect. So the memory, right, man's brain, woman's brain. So if you have a man's brain and a woman's brain literally with you, you will notice that the wires on the man's brain will be going from one to the next to the next to the next compartment. But in the woman's brain, it'll be zigzagged all over the place. I mean, I'm not lying. This is a neurological thing. You can ask a doctor. At Harvard, they brought us these MRIs of two brains, and they showed us. So here are two brains at rest, rest mode. When the man's brain is at rest, what will happen? 
Nothing. Totally. <laughs> Woman's brain is at rest. What will happen? <laughs> so I realized that the, my, my client, if he's a man, he's going to have memory, which is a gist of what is happening. He's going to have some low uh, memory and attention spans and intelligent, no doubt, but that's all he can do. Whereas me, with my memory details, and my client who's a woman with the memory details will have a lot of details. Oh, you remember that day ma'am had come and she had spoken at I am. The women will all remember the color of the sari. Men, if you shut your eyes now, you won't know the color of my sari today. <laughs> they will know that when that happened and this conversation happened at that meeting and price was brought up, you remember the expression on that CFO's face? <laughs> Men will just say, the meeting went well. <laughs> So knowing this and knowing that organizationally I wanted to capture the New Zealand delegations that were coming last year and the year before, I found that the Trade Commissioner in Delhi was a woman for the first time, Jane Cunliffe. So I, I knew she was interested in the heritage of India and all of that. So I helped her to set up a tour in South India, staying in a beautiful heritage uh, club instead of a seven star hotel, um, explained to her that I'd love to have opportunities to work with the delegation because these are the nuances of India, the unpalpable soft power of India that will keep you in the long term in our country. And Jane was quite happy. She's a very strong feminist. And um, so she came and actually worked. That's Jane sitting in the middle in my foundation now working even with all the young girls, underprivileged girls from Nagaland and Tamil Nadu that I brought together to do a workshop. So Jane was so well communicated by me, that's the wrong sentence, but was so, built a relationship with me through communication that when the New Zealand Prime Minister came, I was invited to come and do the talk for the entire business delegation, which was my desired outcome. So I leveraged the fact that Jane would be interested in a lot of details and a lot of fuzzy communication. But her counterpart, Ralph Hayes, he's in Bombay. He's the trade commissioner in Bombay. What did I want out of Ralph? I wanted him to rent a house from us because in Bombay you have to make money. So when I want to be in touch with Ralph Hayes, he's just going to have a gist. He was also there at my speech, but he's not going to remember all these details. How do you communicate with men best? Yeah, send them an email and put on the subject line a very clear one line, which is what is in the email. And just put that. Don't put five other things under that also in the email and expect that everything is going to be um, captured and digested. So with Ralph, I just said, when are you coming? Uh, yeah, I do that with my husband. I send him a one line email. <laughs> and I say, uh, just the monthly funds for the house. That's all. That email is just that. Because if we do it, we'll try to do the, the we'll connect it all, right? The funds for the house with the tuition for the children, with the dropping of the maid, and, and then it's too much for him to handle. So, um, but in this case with Ralph Hayes, I just sent him an email three months before. When are you coming to India? Will you need help in Bombay? He said, not till March. You know what? I left him alone. Sometimes we have to learn to leave the men alone also because then it's when it's relevant and when it's important and it's coming right up, then you can remind and say, hey, one month to go, Ralph, can I help with housing? We have a great team set up in Bombay. So last month he said, sure, I'm sure you're a professional. Please send someone to show me the houses. And last week, we actually clinched the house for Ralph in Bombay. We're delighted. But I wanted to show you the strategic difference that you could do when you're dealing with the other side and you know how the mindset works. Then at the national level, right? So you know this, right? When we are resting, we're completely this buzzing. And when they are resting, they're completely shut down. So when I, have you seen this ever? <laughs> <laughs> That's the wrong time to have a meaningful, soulful conversation. So what you want to do is wait for the rest is about being quiet. It's about zoning out. And that's the wrong time to say, what are you thinking? <laughs> because they'll say, nothing. <laughs> nothing. You must be thinking about that girl we, we saw no, just now in that grocery shop, that girl. 
or maybe he's thinking something you don't want to tell me that's why how can you think nothing hey hey guys girls the guys can think nothing just leave it <laughs> so that's the wrong time to try to have that conversation so, but i asked my husband i want to do something at a national level i've written a book make it in india i put modi on the cover i put obama on the cover how, what can i do i want to do something on the national stage that was the wrong time right he was like that so he didn't say anything to me but later later when he was in an engaged mode all i said is i really value what you have to say usually can you tell me and this is you my husband okay and i'm saying uh, can you tell me what do you think how can i make a difference at a national level and he had a eureka moment he said there's this guy who's a make in india guy who's modi's right hand he is amit amit you have half the name right no 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 make in india amitabh kant so he said ha abhi niti ayog hai tabhi make it in make in india tha wo so they said he said why don't you try to reach him that's it once we women get our claws and we know what to do we just go after it right so i decided to try to reach amitabh kant now the problem is this men will upplay their work we're great we're fabulous we've done well great and women will I'm just a small entrepreneur. I've just written this small book, and this small man called Narayan Murthy has written the foreword. And I've just interviewed some eleven small CEOs. So can you give me a small minute of your time? He'll go get out, or he'll probably go delete on the email, right? So I had to learn and practice to upplay what I had to offer. And I actually said, "You guys are doing a great job of making India, but I can get expats." to come and tell other expats about the success of india story wouldn't you like that let me come and help you and then it was well have another quiz but i'll come back to that oh i can't come back and then it ended up with amitabh kant absolutely appreciating the book and now absolutely involving us in areas where we love to serve the nation so three times three stories and i'm just trying to say what did we do we strategically did something to work with it so those are the three the first lesson in my mind from the first story is can we understand the strengths and leverage the differences so it might be your boss who's very different from you it might be your wife who's very different from you leverage the differences if both of us were the same how boring life would be the other is in the second story i think the strategy gave me the best outcome for ralph and jane so i'm sure in your own lives you'll be able to think about that strategic so strategize for the best outcome and the last is you know each of you has your own expertise nobody else can do as well the thing that you do please believe in that man or woman doesn't matter and confidently bet on that expertise and then the world is your oyster i want to end this part of my talk with a video that i have of kirtiga reddy who's a facebook india ceo but she's just left and moved to mark zuckerberg's headquarters right now and kirtiga tells a very good story called the power of and i was interviewing her for this book and i think whether we are uh, it, it's irrespect it's gender neutral her advice but the story she shares is a woman's story but think about how you in your life could use the power of and um when my second child was born i was uh, i was running product management and i had a lot of client meetings travel to do and i remember thinking to myself that oh it's really important for me to nurse arya who was my second child for the full year because that's what i did for ashna my older one and I remember thinking to myself this is a point that people always talk about where i have to make trade offs between my personal life and my professional life and then it occurred to me that i don't have to and for the first year of course i delegated a lot of travel but then for the ones that i really that could make a difference if i went i actually took her with me and uh, every place i went things worked out you know i went to north carolina one of my colleagues wives had a daycare before and she said i'll take care of your child i went to dallas again another colleague arranged for arya to go to his son's daycare and so i used to nurse go to my meetings nurse um and you know it all just worked out i'm not saying that everyone needs to make the choices that i do but i would say push the boundaries think about situations where it seems like an or is there a way that you can convert it to an and
Thank you. I'll pause there because I think the real conversation happens around question answers. Yes. So do you have a mic or how do you do that? And your video might want to take him. Um, while going to the campus here, I saw a billboard, a many of the advertisements, a lady multitasking. So sometimes it puts to my mind, are we asking too much? Or what would be the level that will be set if we are saying we are exploiting? The things they can do. Mm. So, are they expecting too much from ourselves as a lady, or as men? Are we will we be expecting too much from a lady because she has a house? And how much of this and will not lead to exploitation mm. in years to come? Very good question. And you know what? We're right at the cusp of having to focus on that because paternity leave is just going to start coming into our country. <laughs> it's coming. Nokia has six months. I mean, Finland has six months. Sweden has six months paternity leave. We don't, but it's going to come. Um, so I think multitasking itself is like oxygen in a way to the way that we live these days. But I'm also a very big believer of focusing attention on one thing at one time, which was there in our tradition and in our way of life many years ago, centuries ago. You know, this M word that none of us does, the meditation, was meant to be, I don't know, maybe this group is different, but otherwise, most of us were meant to focus our attention for 20 minutes a day so that the rest of the day could flow in a little less stressful way and you could actually follow the task one after the other instead of one and the other because you neither enjoy the one nor the other. If you're also eating breakfast and you're also trying to run to work, and you're also combing your child's hair on the side, I think you're losing the pleasure of combing your daughter's lovely hair, which she will cut the moment she's a teenager. <laughs> and you're losing the pleasure of eating that yummy idli, which is so soft, and you're running to work without any pre-planning of what you're going to do when you get there. So I'm not a big believer in super multitasking. I love doing one thing at a time. And the only way this comes about in our lives is if we can spend some time with ourselves. Me space and me time is so important. Just say, how many people in this room do that? Great. Great. There's a very good resource. Um, where uh, this, if in case the rest of you doesn't want to be, you know, India has got too many gurus, so we're spoiled for choice. We don't know what to do. So instead of that, there is a really simple website called bmcm.org. That's the Blue Mountain Center of Meditation. All that they do is give you a methodology of memorizing a passage, which for, can be from any uh, faith or poem, and going over the words of a passage in your mind for intellectual high quality people like you, it'll be difficult to do just focus on your breath, focus on om, hard, focus on nothing, impossible. Your brain is wired to do a lot. So maybe you will need what, what worked for me finally in my later years is passage meditation because I love to be on the words of an inspirational passage and it does two things. It helps you become what you meditate on and it helps you train your attention. But how much is too much? I don't know, that's an individual choice. But if you can have quality over quantity, that will always be better, right? Yeah. Um, Ma'am, I have a question. Uh, I have read and uh, I also feel that uh, women give more importance to likability than being successful. Mm. So <clears throat> if given a choice, they want to be more likable more light than climbing on the success ladder. Do you think that comes as a barrier at times? It absolutely is a barrier. It is impossible for us to be liked by everybody all the time. Forget it. If we can be nice and get 
most people to like us some of the times, that's enough. That's all I've ever aspired to be because if I try to be everything to everybody, it completely stops you from growth. And don't you think that is the reason we take more on us because we want to be accepted in every zone, whether it's family, it's extended family, it's work, it's yeah. extended work and everywhere. Yes. Yes, remind me of your name, it's not Priyanka. Priyanka. Uh, you're right, Priyanka, and I always say to women that I mentor, I work with women sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, and I always tell them, give yourself permission to be imperfect. What is wrong with that? If you take on too much, then you saw that AC Nielsen study of the most stressed women in the world? Yes. Indian women, number one. Spain, Mexico and all is far behind us because we have to make that laddu only on that karva chot and we have to be in office extended hours for the project. How is it possible? So I guess you're asking, is it all right that I can't be everything to everybody? And my answer is a resounding yes. Pick the people that are important. Be sure that you are able to look after them. But at times your career has to take over. And at other times, your work, your life, home life has to take over. And that's just a balance. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I'm just productivity aspect. Instead of differences, like, uh, do you actually have an effect on productivity as well? <laughs> on the productivity of men and women? No, I think the productivity can be equal in the given task. Try hard, then others, you know, they just want to know. Yeah. Uh, Karishma has a counter response. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to say that women, I think, are more productive. Because, say, I mean, I, I was thinking to it, but I was not direct. Uh, so I just wanted to know, like, uh, is it really proven somewhere that it is very different than between men and women, or is it just the same, or, or it, is, it is there and nobody yeah. has to <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think you're, you're the speaker right now. Go ahead. So I had a 70% or 75% woman company. And then I realized that I, at one time I wanted only women because when I started 22 years ago, women were not being given jobs that much, you know? And I thought this is a service industry, it's the right thing to, for me to bring women in. But then I realized I was doing the reverse discrimination and that's not the right thing. You need gender balance. Gender intelligence is gender balance. You need both. So, but to answer your question on productivity, I don't know of a research or study, but I'll be very happy to find out and tell you. I'm sure there must be something out there. Let me find out and tell you, but I can't claim. In my team, or even in my client offices, I can tell you that Salcomp, which is the world's largest charger manufacturer. What is our cell phone without a charger, right? He creates all the chargers. Salcomp is a Finnish company in Chennai. They have a factory there now. He employs only women. Salcomp has only women in the factory. It's because hand-eye coordination of women is far better than men. Proven. <laughs> Proven by the Finns. I don't know. They have only women in the Salcomp factory, and they, use, they say it's super productive. They export to China, and they export to everywhere from here. Okay, I'll find out, though, if there's a study. The mic has to jump. Uh, hi. hi. I have two questions. Pay parity has been a hot button issue for the last decade or so. I'm not debating whether there is a pay gap. There is. But any particular steps that the women, especially in our class, can take to bridge this gap very, very important, right? Pay parity. So I think people are talking about having a sponsor in multinational corporations. So when you get into a corporate life, look for that sponsor and see whether you can rally around that sponsor and create a buzz about the importance of uh, more egalitarian pay. That's the only thing I can think of. Did you see that quiz I was just showing you? I have read Lean In and there's a chapter on negotiation and how we don't negotiate better when we have the opportunity to do so. Thank you for reminding me. That was the quiz I just fast forwarded. 
in Lean In, Sheryl Sandberg says, 58% of men will negotiate their first salary. And women, only 7%. Only 7 So yeah, please ask for what you want. Ask for what you want. Whether you receive it or not is a different thing. But that you will 100% not receive without asking is a given. So you have to ask. Ask for space and ask for money and ask for time. Because economic independence of the woman is the empowerment of the woman. What was the second question? It went out of your head. What price am I getting? <laughs> <laughs> OK. So the prize, we have the IPS officer giving you the prize of my book. Sir, can you please hand him my book? <laughs> See? Ask and you shall receive women. Nobody asked for the book. There's one more book going. I had a question. Uh, you spoke about leveraging the differences and uh, what, I mean, you have been on, uh, all over the world and to many places. So what advice you will give to the women in business club to uh, the first first women in business club in I am Bangalore? Advice as in? As in uh, what steps they should take uh, from here till the end of the year? How should they leverage this particular? Association, the yes. organization. Okay, so I guess they're on the right track. They're trying to learn by co-mentorship, I'm guessing, right? There are 22 women from different walks of life with different work experiences. And what you're hoping to do is co-mentor each other. So in that co-mentorship, don't do the crab syndrome. You know the crab in the bottle, no? Pulling the other crabs down. So work consciously to push the other crab out. So if one crab gets out, each one can climb on its back and get out of the bottle. So I think that's one of the challenges that we women can have. That, that's why we are called meow meow or whatever, or the female dog or whatever. And I think that is something we have to stay very conscious of and get out of that uh, syndrome. And the one thing that we can do in organizations like women's uh, groups is please, in, seriously I meant this, please invite men speakers. I believe that a mentor should be a man. I told you earlier, I have a mentor, he's, he's Sumantran. My other mentor is Lakshmi Narayan of Cognizant. Because I think mentors as men are better in some form. Because when you go to a woman and you say, it's so hard, you know, my son's 10th standard exam and I have to do this, she'll say, oh yeah, I know, that's so hard. But the man will say, what are you talking about? Get over it, just get on with it. He won't even be able to empathize or sympathize because he doesn't understand. We need that sometimes. We women don't need this too much of this, oh, you poor thing. No, you poor thing. That's done. You poor thing means you should have sit at only at home. And I don't believe that any woman in today's India can be without a job. We must work. We have to work at bringing up our own two children and the nation's 200,000 children at least. That's in our one lifetime. We should be doing that in whatever form we can. Okay. So, so I understand your question, but the bottom line is what I said earlier, which is leverage the differences as a strength, not leverage, make the differences to tear you apart. Bring it together for the mutual strength and the optimal outcome that we need. So for instance, you focus on similarities rather than differences, right? When you're talking about cultures. But if you just focus on similarities, the German, so he, somebody here said they were with Hero. Who was in Hero before? Yeah, so Hero Daimler was a joint venture at one time and they were our clients. But that joint venture fell apart because the Hero was the Punjab Munjal group and the Daimler was the 
sharp German group that got together. And that joint venture, there were differences, but the differences were swept under the carpet. The point in knowing the differences is to adapt to the other and look more at similarities, which is the organizational goal of producing the best trucks in the country. If you do that, then a joint venture works very well in, in intercultural work. And I think each of us brings strengths, whether we are uh, from one culture or the other. And it's those strengths that we need to focus on. Because it's a short time today, I only showed stories of how I leveraged the difference. But all the other times, we're only looking at the commonality and the similarities of people. And then we're working together more holistically, right? It's not to tear it apart. But it's also a blind spot if you think there's no difference. It's going to be the same. Try doing a performance appraisal for a woman and a man and start the performance appraisal with the, for the woman. I've done this saying, um, how's your mother doing? I am hope the operation went well. You're so good at managing this and that. So I want to give you the appraisal. You're at an 8 out of 10, but you have to work better on this. She'll think that we're being kind and caring. Try that on a man. How's your mother doing? How are you managing everything, this and that? He'll think, just give me the bad news. What is it? <laughs> what is it you want to tell me? <laughs> so I, I'm saying you should know and you should be able to say that communi I'm saying adapt your communication. I'm not saying change your heart and your mind to the other person. But ma'am, there'll be men who would like that equally. So it's not so much. Also that personality. I told you that. You can't stereotype. Absolutely. It's also personality has a big role to play. You're absolutely right, Karishma. Yes, absolutely. Good way, good, good example. Absolutely. She just wants to vent. Yes. <laughs> 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 she wants to. Yeah. They don't want to hear the solution. Exactly. And that one statement stayed with me, and I have not thought about it over it again. But when, if I go with that thought to my uh, to a female friend of mine, she would say, "Arey yaar, har jagah aisa hi hota hai." Yeah. And sometimes you don't want to hear all yes, that. Yes. Yes. You want somebody else to bring things to perspective. So I feel that then there is. Well done. Can you congratulate your husband from me? <laughs> Super answer. He deserves a book. He deserves a book. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So I've ended my um, slide with a poll. I request you to go to Twitter and go to at Ranjani Manian. I want to see if there's any use in spending an hour with people and just bringing to light some of these challenges that we can leverage to our own strengths. So I've just got like a 10 second thing that I want you to do. Please take the time to do that either today, I mean either now or at your own time, it doesn't matter. And please stay in touch with me. You're welcome to ask individual one-to-one -one questions or um, anything that I can help with. And thank you once again so much for having me at IIMB.